Hi, my name is Theo Gonzalez, and welcome to Viral Histories, Stories of Racism, Resilience, and Resistance. In this series, we're exploring the impact that the pandemic is having on the Asian American community. Today, we're talking with Russell Jung, who is a professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State University. Russell helped to create a website that allows people to report incidents of hate against persons of Asian heritage. We'll be thinking about how a community rallies in the face of racial and ethnic discrimination in the middle of a public health emergency. My co-host for the series is Lantaro Donovan, who is a high school student in Maryland. Hello America, break your back for dollars, they don't carry ya. Seven thousand miles away from home with language barriers, land of opportunity. Tell me is it good to you? But six so my first question is, um, why did you start your organization and how exactly has the problem of anti-Asian discrimination, which was extant before the pandemic, how has it grown because of the pandemic? Uh, that's a good question. Thanks. And thanks for inviting me. Um, of course. As an Asian American Studies faculty member, I, I knew that in past epidemics, Asians would get scapegoated and targeted um, mm -hmm. as the cause of the pandemic. And so I knew once the coronavirus was going to spread and that it was coming from China, that Chinese in the US would be um, blamed and then therefore experience incidents of discrimination and harassment. So um, I immediately wanted to document what was going on in order to. Um, to get a response from the government, because it's the government's responsibility to provide for public safety. And I knew that without good documentation, um, no one would believe that Asian Americans were facing such harassment. Initially, um, I looked at news accounts because that was the only secondary source data, but eventually we started our own website and we got a flood of personal accounts, firsthand accounts of how Asian Americans are experiencing racism because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I find it very interesting about how you mentioned in previous epidemics um, that Asians were scapegoated or targeted. Um, you know, people would claim that they're, you know, causing the pandemic, something like that. Could you give um, maybe recent examples or relatively recent examples from American history when that's happened? Well, the most recent one that Asian Americans were blamed was SARS in 2003. And so again, um, again, it's a natural disease, it's a virus, but it, um, a particular people are blamed and a particular place is blamed for causing the disease. And really, pandemics spread naturally um, through community spread, and it's not like a people designed to spread it. Now, Russell, can you think about what this means historically? Um, how have Asian Americans been in this particular uh, moment before? What does it mean in terms of Asian American history to consider the relationship between public health and race? Yeah, so history repeats itself. In the 19th century, um, the white working men's party, they blamed Chinese for um, making white workers lose their jobs, but they also blamed Chinese for bringing in the diseases of smallpox, leprosy, and malaria. So they used that rationale, economic competition and disease, and also the fact that um, Chinese were non-Christian and were seen as pagans, they used that um, reasoning to exclude Chinese and they passed legislation, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 um, to get rid of the competition, to blame them for the diseases and to help um, particular po politicians get ahead. And so you see the same sort of practice happening today, politicians using um, this disease as a way to rile up their base, um, seeing China as a target to blame and Chinese people as the source of their economic woes. So um, it's sort of scary how it repeats itself. But in the 19th century, one other way that history repeats itself is that Chinese really resisted that discrimination. They filed thousands of appeals in the courts against the Chinese Exclusion Act. They created a, a mass boycott against American goods. And they engaged in the largest case of mass civil disobedience um, at that time, hundreds of thousands of Chinese actually didn't register or obey the government in requiring them to get an alien certificate card. So today we're seeing history repeat itself, and I see a lot of Asian American groups um, resisting and combating the racism that they face today. So the resistance to this is also historic as well. It it also comes in cycles. Um, we're seeing uh, this in the in the present tense. Um, how politicians are referring to this as a Chinese virus. What is, what's wrong with referring to it that way? 
So the problem of calling it the Chinese virus is that a particular group of people get stigmatized, they get blamed, and as a result, they get harassed and targeted for being the source of the disease. They get feared um, as being the disease carriers, and they get um, people see them as threats, as outsiders. And we see that happening all across the nation. And in the website that you created at Stop AAPI Hate, um, it collected, well, how many incidents are, are now collected there? Is it, is it close to about 2,000? Yeah, it's almost 2,000 now. We just started it a little bit over a month ago. And <clears throat> again, we didn't, we didn't publicize the site that much, but I think Asian Americans across the nation really wanted to share their stories um, to develop a collective voice so that we could respond well, so that we could um, have data and have targeted interventions responding to the evidence. Um, what's remarkable is that a lot of our reports are coming from non-English speaking people, that they care enough that they wanted to um, express their outrage over facing this inequality. A lot of the incidents are being reported by elderly. So you don't think of Asian American elderly taking the time to get on the internet and file a report. But yeah, over 10% of our cases are coming from Asian American elderly. That's pretty remarkable. And compared to the amount of people who have used your website and reported, how many incidents do you believe have gone unreported? Is there, um, how, how much of a mass incidence is there when it comes to this discrimination? Everybody who's Asian American is only like one degree of separation from someone who's been harassed or shunned or attacked. 90% of Asian Americans today now fear racial bias because of COVID-19. Um, so that's, that's pretty telling that almost everybody in the Asian American community is fearful at this moment. Mm -hmm. Russell, can we talk about how the community is trying to respond directly to it? So they're using your website as a tool um, to, to report many of these incidents, but what are some of the ways in which the Asian American community is responding? Um, the Asian American community is responding on a variety of race, ways, um, depending on their location and depending on like what institutions or groups are affiliated with. Our elected officials, I think, are taking a really strong stand uh, on both the congressional level and on the state level, um, passing resolutions to denounce anti-Asian hate and rhetoric. Um, on the media level, which again circulates a lot of these um, negative images of Chinese and the virus, in the media, um, We've created our own hashtag movements like um, wash the hate or I am not a virus or race um, or um, racism is a virus. On the community level, um, I see groups, um, unions, faith-based groups. Um, a lot of schools are just making their own statements saying we denounce this type of behavior, we don't condone it. And those words matter, right? Just as the words Chinese virus matter, the words that say we will not condone any racism, they matter and they help people create a, a culture of civility and respect. Um, and then on the individual level, I think a lot of people are being good bystanders that when they see this type of discrimination, they're, they're um, intervening and, and um, checking in with the targeted individual, um, seeing if they need assistance. So I think we have a lot of allies um, right now, even as much as we see a lot of racism, we see a lot of um, people supporting Asian Americans and realizing that this type of discrimination is wrong. Historically and in the present, Asian Americans have generally been the least politically active of most of the major minority groups in the country. Um, I believe in 2012, Asian American turnout was around 49% compared to over 60% for African Americans. Um, those numbers are very uh, rough. But um, do you think because of this pandemic, because of the very political issues, which is which it has brought attention to, especially when it comes to fighting hate crimes and discrimination targeting Asian American community. Do you think that this pandemic might be a turning point, that this might ignite new civic engagement um, in future elections? I think Asian Americans have always been politically active. Um, they may not always vote in the United States because a lot of them aren't citizens, um, or they may not get targeted for um, campaign materials because they're new voters and not um, likely voters, but right. they're always engaged in their local communities or even transnationally. But I do think, like you said, this is a galvanizing moment for the Asian American community. First of all, um, it's not just Chinese who are being affected, it's, it's a very pan-Asian experience, especially if you look East Asian. 
And so that a lot of people, different people are being targeted. 60% um, of those reporting are not Chinese, but there are other Asian ethnicities. It's, it's an issue that cuts across us on class lines. So that even if you think, oh, I've made it in the US, I'm well-educated, I have high professional status, even those healthcare professionals, they're getting harassed and shunned in, in the medical. And then again, working class Asians, they're losing their livelihood because uh, people are boycotting Asian restaurants and nail salons. So it's affecting us across class, it's crossing, uh, affecting us across ethnicity. As we understand that we're being racially profiled as outsiders, as threats, as um, dangerous, I think we'll understand how other groups are also being racially profiled and therefore being incarcerated, therefore being detained, therefore being deported, therefore being banned. Asian Americans are gonna experience this and realize, wow, we hold a lot in common with other people of color. I think that'll also um, mobilize us. Um, I was just wondering, um, do you think that this might also be a moment of, I guess, pan-minority unity, that this might ignite more of a, uh, I guess, social justice movement within Asian communities that isn't just about Asian Americans, but more all minorities' rights? Right, yeah, I agree. It's gonna be both a pan-Asian movement, but it's also gonna um, align us and give us a greater sense of solidarity with other people of color as well. You could mm -hmm. tell from COVID-19, all the structural racism of the United States is becoming more and more apparent as African Americans are infected at higher rates, as the Navajo Nation is infected at higher rates, as the Hispanic Latinx community has higher rates of unemployment, um, mm -hmm. and as Asian Americans discriminated, you could see, wow, there's clear racial disparities being revealed by um, COVID-19. So Asian Americans are affected by this um, anti-Asian hate, but this isn't an Asian American problem. This isn't an Asian American issue. This is actually other people's issue with us. This is other people's problem with us. It's other people's racism. So in, in that sense, the Asian American community can resist and respond, but it's gonna take a societal response to erase hate. And so that's why we're really pushing to hold government accountable because government's the one that's supposed to be responsible for public safety and also providing safe accommodations. Everybody has the right to get safe access to goods and services, but Asians aren't getting that safe access right now. They're getting harassed, they're getting pushed out, they're getting spat upon. And so um, we're really working and hoping that um, government officials would take stronger stands against this anti-Asian hate. So once again, thank you. Uh, we'll thank Lintaro Donovan, who served as our co-host for today. And thanks especially to Russell Jung, who is a chair and professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco yeah. State University. Uh -huh. Stay tuned today yeah. for the live uh -huh. Q&A session yeah. at 3 p.m. Eastern uh -huh. time, and we'll see you soon. Hello, America. Break your backs for dollars, stay on carrier. 7,000 miles away from home with language barriers. Land of opportunity. Tell me, is it good to you? But six feet deep until... Hi there, I'm Theo Gonzalez, and I'm the curator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Thank you for joining us for this live segment of Viral Histories. In this segment, we hope you can ask some questions, dig deeper into this topic, and walk away with some new understandings of how our past continues to inform our present. All this week, we've been talking with folks who have a ground-level view of this pandemic. On Monday, we spoke with um, Max Leung, who founded the San Francisco Peace Collective. On Tuesday, we talked with Abby DeMesa, who is a frontline nurse in New Jersey. And on Thursday, we'll be hearing from Genevieve Villamoro, who operates a restaurant called Bad Saint in Washington, D.C. On Friday, uh, we've been, um, well, all this week, we've also been featuring on our social media channels the important work of Grace Young and the Japanese American National Museum and others who are working to build community during this time. Again, thank you for joining us. Let's also start with some ground rules for this discussion. Uh, please send in your questions to the chat box. For the program, we ask that you do not post any private or personal information in there. If you're a parent or a teacher watching with your students, we encourage you to actively watch with them. Please also be respectful of those talking or sharing questions and thoughts in the chat. Listen with an open mind. Assume the best intentions as we are all in this together. We expect all comments to be respectful and appropriate. So joining us today, we have 
Russell Jung, who is professor and department chair of Asian American Studies from San Francisco State University. And all this week, we've had Ruby Abara, rapper, producer, and activist. Um, so let's get into the, um, uh, some of your reactions uh, to the video. We'll start with Ruby. Wanted to know what you were thinking about when, uh, when you heard this segment concerning Russell and this, this website that he helped to create called Stop AAPI Hate. First, I wanted to say it's a pleasure to meet you, Russell. It's an honor uh, to be in this discussion with you. Um, and I really enjoyed the interview and conversation with Russell. I felt like it was very insightful. And I'm glad that he highlighted the fact um, you know, that history is cyclic and it continues to inform us and that he provided um, many examples of um, with, within American history where Asian Americans have been discriminated, discriminated against. Um, you know, whether that was, as Russell mentioned, SARS in 2003, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, and I, I can think even beyond that, you know, from like the incident that happened to Vincent Chin in the 1980s, um, where, you know, a victim of racially targeted violence. And um, even beyond just the, the news coverage that we've seen, um, you know, whether it permeates in, in the media, um, that, that leads me to, to remember about the depictions of Fu Manchu, who was a fictional character, a super vi villain. Um, and I think that was kind of the beginning of where Asian Americans started to get vilified in, in this country. And um, historically, the, the, even the yellow peril, you know, the notion that East Asians are a danger or a threat to the Western world. And I see a lot of that really um, increasingly rise again during these times. And um, of course, it's unfortunate, but I think we can also, as, as Russell mentioned in, in the interview, take this all as a, as a learning moment to see how we can avoid a lot of, um, you know, this discrimination and these stereotypes moving forward. All right, thank you, Ruby. Um, Russell, your comments after, uh, after we had recorded that video, um, Anything else that you'd like to add? And, and we could stick with this topic of the cyclical nature of this. I'd like to also kind of think about how not only the discrimination is uh, cyclical and, and, and rhymes with time, uh, the resistance to it is, is also uh, the same. Um, but there's also another aspect of this where we think about the attraction of immigrants to, um, to these countries. They are attracted because they're recruited as cheap labor. And so in many ways, they're they're welcomed uh, in in certain times, and then it, it it takes historical circumstances to change their fate where they become excluded. So you can think about the recruitment of laborers to those gold mines uh, in in California or the plantations in Hawaii, actively recruited all throughout Asia, and then some years take some th take the toll on them and where they become excluded. 1882, 1924, 1934, the Tidings McDuffie Act. What do you think about these? these ongoing cycles of history, how can we learn and maybe even unlearn some of uh, some of the worst of this? Yeah, well, thanks, Theon. Um, good to see you, Ruby. Um, big fan. Um, yeah, you know, the push-pull factors of immigration in the United States actually <clears throat> reveal that the U.S. isn't really a nation that welcomes strangers and the poor and the immigrant, but rather um, we're seen as commodities. Right, we're seen as if we're useful to the economy, then we'll be welcomed as workers. But if we're no longer useful, we're disposable, and <clears throat> that's sort of a um, a view of American history and of American immigration that I think isn't necessarily taught in high schools. We think that America is a you know that the Statue of Liberty welcomes everybody, but in reality, as you could see even in the recent immigration ban, that immigrants um, are welcomed when Americans feel like they need them and can use their skills and then we're excluded when um, we're seen as threats or taking away jobs and so you see that pattern of history um, continue and again <clears throat> but we again we see the pattern of history of immigrants and especially Asian Americans resisting you know um, saying America shouldn't just be we shouldn't be only perceived for our economic utility, but we should be seen as family members. We should be seen as um, participating citizens and residents, and we should be seen as humans who are deserving of human dignity. And that pattern of exclusion and attraction is really global, isn't it? When we think about that, 
that documentary by Lonnie Ding, Ancestors in the Americas, she's, she's posing this really global question when you have the African slave trade closing at the beginning of the 1800s, then you see the opening of the recruitment of Asian labor throughout the Americas to the point now where we, we have a Chinatown in Havana. Uh, and that can only really be explained by the replacement of, of Asian labor uh, for, uh, that, that used to be African. So this is really a, a, a global uh, kind of history. And one thing that we can be keeping in mind, especially since this is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, is that Asian American history is not just a national history. It's really a transnational one. Yeah, that's true. You know, again, so my great grandfather originally um, migrated to Panama. And so it's a global transnational history where we're, um, immigration is really shaped by transnational market trends. That means that <clears throat> labor groups go to where markets are opened up, but if markets close, then they'll just go to places where um, they can find jobs. And so that's sort of the history of Asian migration. It's again, because of famine, because of war, because of poverty, um, people go to where the jobs are and to where the resources are. And so. Um, it's sort of sad now that we're building national borders and walls when we need more global cooperation and support. So even, you know, like, again, this isn't just an Asian issue. When you think about people being detained at the border, um, they're not being treated as humans or as family members. They're being seen as commodities. Are they taking away jobs or not? And I, I, I think that type of underlying assumption, who deserves to be an American? based on your economic usefulness is sort of dangerous and actually pretty, a sad way of looking at others. If there's one thing that is probably more American than anything else, it is that question, what is an American? And they've been asking that question, we've been asking that question, everyone's been asking that question for centuries now. Um, Ruby brought up uh, the killing of Vincent Chin uh, just a few minutes ago, and I wanted to, to um, have you both consider this quote because it, it gets us to kind of think about the this term and uh, this question of anti-Asian violence uh, cross-racially. Um, I recently interviewed Rene Tajima Pena, the director of this new Asian Americans documentary series that has that has premiered on PBS, um, and she said in this interview with uh, with me that um, I don't think that as Asian Americans we can keep on invoking the killing of Vincent Chin and that injustice unless we stand up and fight against the racial violence perpetrated on black and brown Americans. The roots of racism are everybody's problem, including ours. And justice is not just us. Ruby, what do you, what do you think of Renee's comments? She was also the director of that documentary, Who Killed Vincent Chin. So with, with the context of um, what happened to Vincent Chin, I also wanna um, relate it back to Russell's interview earlier. And I thought it was particularly interesting that Russell mentioned that um, I think I believe Russell said 60% of the reports were not from Chinese Americans. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, this tells me that you just really need to look phenotypically East Asian um, during these times to, to be a victim of a lot of the AAPI hate that we see. And um, ultimately, I, I feel like racial profiling is always rooted in stereotypes. And um, as Asian Americans who are facing this right now during these times, I think it's one of the key things to, to take note of and be cognizant of is, you know, the fact that um, that we need to not only rise up together as an Asian, Asian American community, but to understand moving forward, how can we also help those who do face racial profiling on a daily basis, pre-pandemic or post-pandemic? Um, I mentioned this earlier in the week, um, I think that um, a lot of the hate that's targeted towards the Asian American community, um, the, the, the target group is just a variable. It could have been any group, um, depending on the depictions, you know, from the media or, or the news coverage that we've seen a lot of the, the um, rhetoric that's been spewed. Um, so I think as Asian Americans, what we do need to learn from this situation is how can we stand in solidarity with other communities of color? Yeah, I agree. You know. Um, I think Asian Americans do need to stand in solidarity with other communities of color who are facing injustice and racism. And even in the case of the COVID-19 discrimination, 
Um, recently, a Latino person was attacked because they were perceived as being Asian. There were news reports of an indigenous um, person in Canada being punched because they were perceived as being Asian. Um, so again, like Ruby said, we're being racially profiled, but it cuts across even um, different groups. And so uh, just as much other groups are being impacted by COVID-19, we have to recognize as Asian Americans that we're also impacted by mass incarceration or mass detention, that if other groups um, face racism and face dehumanization, that also, and if we're complicit, then we're dehumanized as well. So um, I think this pandemic shows that a cough from all the way around the world impacts us here, the other side of the world. We're all so interconnected and we need to um, develop that sense of solidarity with each other as human beings. So I really agree that um, we need to stand up. At the same time, you have to recognize a lot of Asian Americans, they're, um, they're fighting for survival. And so they can't always stand up when they're just trying to maintain their livelihood as immigrants and um, trying to raise a family in the United States and trying to adjust to a new culture. So I don't, I don't blame a lot of Asian Americans if they're sort of focused on their own ethnic group and strengthening their ethnic community. But if we have the opportunity, if we have the privilege, then we should stand up for other groups. Thank you, Russell. I mean, the, the economic impact that, that this pandemic is having on, on our Chinatowns is, is very real, whether it's New York or San Francisco. We know that, that, uh, that both Chinatowns are operating at less than 5% uh, capacity. And so it's, it's taking a massive uh, toll uh, on these communities. We want to turn to a question that's coming in. Knowing that COVID originated in Wuhan, China, what preparation, if any, can or did Asian American communities undertake for the stereotyping that was expected? Yeah, thanks Aaron for that question. <clears throat> so again, knowing that um, COVID-19 originated in Wuhan and knowing again our history, and that's why you should know our history, um, that with every epidemic Asian from Asia, Asians in the US will get targeted. We Im immediately started documenting the, the hate that we were experiencing, right? We first looked at news accounts, uh, um, depicting how we've been harassed, and then we developed a personal reporting center. So um, for me as an academic, I began documenting it, and that's the role of ethnic studies, I feel. Ethnic studies tries to use our community knowledge as a way of power to show, look at our numbers, look at our collective voice. We are having and experiencing a real racial issue right now in live time, and so we need to go to our government, we need to go to the media to talk about it. Um, knowing that again came from China, we've really worked to flip the narrative. People keep on insisting on using the term Chinese virus. They keep on calling it the Wuhan virus. And both the World Health Organization and the CDC say that stigmatizes people. So it has negative impacts. You shouldn't use unscientific terms because it hurts people. And we've seen that people are getting attacked. People are being vilified. People are getting elderly people walking with their grandkids in stroller are being yelled at and having rocks thrown at them. And so um, what we need to do is to sort of disassociate the virus from any group of people and instead hold our government accountable for controlling the pandemic. Don't, right now it's not the time to actually fix blame or try to find the source. It's actually how do we control the disease? I agree with Russell. It's definitely a very problematic um, in using, you know, that the hateful rhetoric and language calling COVID-19 as Chinese virus. And to add to that, even early on, as, as we were starting to learn more about the pandemic a few months ago, I did notice too that a lot of the articles I was reading, every time it was associated with COVID-19, um, the accompanying photo tended to be Asian Americans um, mm. uh, in, in the, in, in, in the headline and um, that's also very problematic. So we do need to be careful about um, what is spread not only in, in, the, in the news, but also on social media. Yeah, actually, sadly, um, the United States has more cases than China for COVID-19 now. Probably most of the spread of the disease comes from Americans spreading it. And so we have to be accountable ourselves as Americans, both to control the disease and to be, you know, be concerned about guarding the public safety internationally of everyone. That's right. And so when we're 
thinking also about how San Francisco, uh, San Francisco's Chinatown re responded to this. Early on in February, there was a, a massive rally of at least a thousand people in San Francisco's Chinatown because they um, knew uh, probably better than anyone else uh, about the, um, what was to come in terms of the epidemic and who could get blamed. And so the, the leaders there uh, uh, in Chinatown also worked with city leaders to assemble this massive rally. And the, the main, it seemed like the main cry for, from the group was fight the virus, not the people. Um, and um, we'll be hearing more from, from that organization soon. I um, wanted to think about this other question that has come in. As we explore the question of who's included as an American, how can we best support the rights of those with an ambiguous status? I'm assuming that that means uh, an ambiguous legal status. From Ashley Naranjo. That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and I'll sort of answer it with in two parts. The first is that right now in the United States, people who are um, have ambiguous status, um, if they're undocumented or if they're on DACA and they have deferred action, um, <clears throat> they're in peril and they don't get testing, they don't get stimulus checks, they don't get unemployment. And so what we need to do, I think, is recognize, well, they're part of our community. Um, they deserve basic human rights like healthcare, like food, like um, financial support. So if, <clears throat> um, what we're doing, at least in my community, is, is first of all, acknowledging their existence in our communities, acknowledge them as neighbors, acknowledge them as family and friends, and again, um, trying to call our government to support them. So in California, we're trying to support people with different types of status. Um, and for me, for Americans really try to assert rights. And so this is my second point. And it's not everybody is deserving of human rights, but we also have human responsibilities. And as an Asian American, I think we have a sense of corporate responsibility for others. And for Asian Heritage Month, I want to actually highlight this is a really key value that should be celebrated and shared with others, that we have a responsibility for everyone. So no matter what their stat is, we have to keep families together. We have to support them in, in getting health care and decent education. And currently, um, people with ambiguous status aren't getting those. And so um, it's our responsibility to guarantee that for everybody. And this has really been the work of civil rights attorneys over the years, hasn't it? I mean, the idea that uh, the protection uh, of civil rights is really not simply for citizens, but civil rights attorneys have, have noticed that constitutionally it's meant to, uh, to protect persons. And so that's really allowed for a very wide and uh, a wide reading of who may be considered a person. Sometimes it's a prisoner, sometimes it's a, a student or a child. So over time, the notion of civil rights continues to expand what we mean by those that are deserving of protection. I want us to think about this discussion uh, as we kind of uh, consider the responses. Both of you talked about some responses to the discrimination, anti-Asian violence, how that's not only ethnic, but also pan-Asian, how it's also cross-racial, how we can learn across uh, racial groups. Well, from both of your perspectives, I know, Russell, you're, um, you focus a lot on the soci uh, sociology of religion. You think about faith and, and religious traditions among Asian Americans. And of course, Ruby is, uh, is a noted rapper and, and hip hop artist. How are both of you seeing the, the creative responses to dealing with such things, either in terms of faith and spirituality and religious observance, uh, or thinking about these in terms of the creativity of, of our arts? What are the ways that we're, we're um, turning this on its head to kind of think about what this, what this pandemic needs in terms of an actual response? Um, we'll start with Russell. Okay, so I've noticed in the Asian American faith-based community, um, a real rallying together against to fight Asian and then also to, again, to fight the pandemic. So it's unusual to see, let's say Christians across theological perspectives, um, both conservative and liberal from Catholic to evangelical work together. But at this moment, Asian American groups have come together <clears throat> and have signed on on a joint statement to actually um, call America to repent 
which is to turn away from its racism to um, and make a commitment <clears throat> to support um, everybody in this pandemic. And so I think for using their moral language and using their community of congregations, they're taking pretty strong stance that I haven't ever seen before. Um, it's pretty hard to bring together people with different theological perspectives, but that's one example that they're using their moral language and their call to repentance as their way of challenging racism. Hmm. Thank you, Russell. Ruby, what are you saying from, from your perspective about the creative responses for this? I mean, that's a really challenging uh, response to be able to, to be, think about uh, people of, of different uh, religious traditions coming together. Um, how does it look from your perspective? For me, um, being an artist and thinking about it from um, the entertainment um, perspective, I have noticed a lot of Asian American entertainers or public figures um, speak out against a lot of the um, hateful rhetoric and the scapegoating that's happening towards the Asian American community. Um, I've seen a lot of, um, uh, not just politicians, but I think also entertainers that have used their platform and used their voice to not only talk about the issues that's going on, but to also inform and educate people about um, you know, why targeting a specific group is the wrong thing to do during these times. And um, even um, such as the um, docu uh, Asian American docu-series that we uh, saw premiere on PBS um, about a week ago, I feel like having a lot of that present in the media, especially during um, Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, I feel like that's very important that we continue to um, also humanize Asian Americans and have um, things like that in the media to um, also remind people about the history, you know, um, that Asian Americans have contributed to this country and um, whether it's through entertainment or through politics. And I know you've mentioned this before, uh, Ruby, in our, our past conversations, uh, this idea of media literacy being something we actually a absolutely need in terms of being able to understand not only our current circumstance, but our, so our historical one. I know the, the blogger and writer Phil Yu likes to talk about APA Heritage Month as, as just uh, one month, but for him, and I do agree with him, every month is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. It's just in, in this month, we kind of turn it up to 11. Um, that is a, that's an old Spinal Tap reference, if anyone gets that. Um, what do you folks think, what, what else do you think our, our young learners can, uh, can benefit from when we think about this, this topic? And, and we, can, um, uh, we can start closing up in, in a few minutes, but um, we'll start with Russell, your, um, your teaching uh, practice in, in, in San Francisco, San Francisco State. I understand that, that the entire CSU system will be going online again for the fall. Um, what does this mean for, from the perspective of you as a teacher how are your students relating to this issue um, when they're reporting back to you either in these Zoom chats or, or online or emails? Yeah, I think it's a really hard time for all students, um, but especially those who don't have as much online access and as well for younger students, those who don't, I, the people watching in the audience today actually clearly have online access and so you're privileged, but a lot of people, um, and especially I live in Oakland in my community, a lot of people don't have online access, so they're not getting access to teachers or to educational materials. So, um, and even those um, at, San, at San Francisco State, a lot of the students are working class. So when I went around my classroom, every family member of my students or themselves, the students themselves have been laid off from work. So they're stressed with the disease, they're stressed with um, being sheltered in place, they're stressed with, um, being laid off. And so handling school at this time is really difficult. And, and as it continues, I think um, it's gonna be harder. So it's up to us as educators to make education um, engaging and still relevant during this time. It's up to us to make online platforms um, a way to critically analyze um, what's happening in our society. And <clears throat> I think it'll be, um, possibly a new way to, um, to educate people where they could learn to share and create media like, like Ruby was talking about. So again, it's both 
really difficult. Certain groups are left out, but it's also an opportunity for us, again, to create our own media, to create our own culture, to create our own music and songs. And so that's what I'm hoping, that during this time, we could use the technology available us to challenge the racism we're all facing. Thank you, Russell. I'll get to Ruby in a second, but I also wanted to remind our viewers that uh, along with all of these online conversations, we have um, a really robust uh, selection of materials that go along with these conversations. You can take a deeper dive as a parent, teacher, or a student, and allows us to kind of focus in on objects that we have in the collection at the Smithsonian, or links to other articles uh, and, um, and writing that would be helpful, uh, that would allow you to kind of think about this. Um, and when we think about these other kinds of creative responses, um, there's another kind of educating that, that Ruby does, which is from the stage and behind the mic. Um, I understand that it's somewhere in, I think it's New Hampshire, that a, a, a venue has created the first opportunity to have a first concert in the middle of this coronavirus. And it's essentially like a, an adaptation of the drive through And so instead of having an indoor concert, this person just built a stage outside of their venue and uh, cars are now parked at, at, uh, at safe spaces uh, wow. from each other. And uh, the artist now is, is still singing from the stage, but um, everyone is tuning in. Um, Ruby, what's it going to look like for you as a performer to, to think about uh, this world that we are, are walking through right now? For me as a performer during these times, um, you know, I've come to recognize the fact that um, it'll be definitely virtual platforms for the foreseeable future. Um, and I also wanted to revisit the, the question earlier, um, speaking from the perspective of a musician, I think it's important as creatives that we do take this moment to speak about these issues in, in, in the work that we do because music is one of those things that people look, to, look for um, in times of healing, in times of peace, in times of finding some sort of solace or serenity. And um, as musicians, we need to be cognizant of that, that the work that we do, um, it's, it's good that we entertain but it's also important that we use it, especially in times like this, use it to, to really speak a message and to uh, spark dialogue um, across communities. And I wanted to end um, just by saying that I, I honestly feel like a lot of the racism that we're seeing towards Asian Americans during this pandemic has exposed the model minority myth. Um, as Russell mentioned earlier, even Asian American healthcare workers you know, are, are getting harassed. And during these times to me, it, it, I feel like it completely debunks the model minority myth. You know, racism does not target a specific class or social status. And as we've seen, racism also doesn't target um, a, a specific racial group. Um, like I said, this this could have happened to any target, any group could have been targeted during these times. And so um, I'd also like for us to think about how we view ourselves as Asian Americans and how other people also view Asian Americans and to um, steer clear from, um, a lot of the model minority stereotypes that, that we've that have been embedded in I think a lot of literature and media. Thank you both for joining us. Um, tomorrow we'll have a discussion with Genevieve Villamora who owns a restaurant in Washington DC called Bad Saint. Uh, we, today we have Russell Jung from San Francisco State University and Ruby Ibarra. I want to be able to thank the folks who helped to make this program happen. That's Abby Fisserer, Maria Sanchez, Eden Cho, Andrea Neighbors, and Emila Grabowski. If you are into this material, please visit us on americanhistory.si.edu. My name is Theo Gonzalez, and thanks again. Take care. <laughs>